Six weeks to Easter and five weeks to Muscle Car Sunday. Yeah, so it's fixing to jump all over us. We, so we, we got a lot of things to get ready for. And uh, many of you that if you're new here, you know our car show is one of our big outreaches. And some of you, how many of you have never been to Muscle Car Sunday? Lift your hand. Amen. Oh, yeah, quite a few of you. So this will be good for you. You'll enjoy this. And, uh, uh, again, it, it's a tremendous opportunity to reach and connect with people. Isaiah chapter 48. Are you comfortable? This week, all, all week long, starting on Sunday, we, Bishop McIntosh shared about process. And, and the thing in me, I, I could not get away from process. I, I, I wanted to go back to Obed Edom because I just I like him. Again, let's just mention Obed Edom. He was an Edomite. Obed Edom. Obed, uh, he was a slave. His name literally meant slave. He was, he, was, uh, he was part of the enemies of God. He was from Gath. A lot of things against that man. And when you start looking at when the presence of God, in my mind, I see a man leaping and dancing. And, I mean, oh, grouch and everything else. But when the presence of God got in his house, it changed everything. I see him changing diapers and washing dishes and, and just being excited about life. Sir, isn't that what happened to you? Okay, a little silence in the house. All right. Uh, but that's where we're heading. Can I get an Amen. But talk to them about the purpose, the purpose, the process. These are the things I want to talk about this morning. And the product, you are not a byproduct. Man, God, you're not something that's just left off to the side. A byproduct is something that is produced in the process in addition to the principal product. As a matter of fact, diesel is known as a byproduct, if I, if I got that right. You know, it was gasoline, but then they pulled diesel off from it, and we found engines that could run it. And why is diesel more expensive than gas? I do not know. Because it is a byproduct of it. But then I've heard different reasons. But the issue is you're not that. The byproduct is a secondary and sometimes unexpected, unattended result. The process gives you the opportunity to proceed and, pro and go into progress. Listen, I love to show forged in fire. There's something about the show of taking the, uh, a piece of metal of any type and beating it and, and, and putting it in the heat till the carbon comes out and it become hardened. And I'm reading the scripture and I said, Lord, this is, this is what I feel, that we are right now, many of us are in the forge and you're fighting it. And you need to understand that God is not going to take you out of it until he produces in you the result he wants. Yes, many of you thought when you got saved, you got saved and say, oh, I'm going to sit back and take it easy. That's not our God. He's not going to let you. He's going to keep pushing you and pushing. He's going to beg you. He's going to talk to you to come out of the boat and walk on the water. He's going to send you into the fire. Amen. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo. And like Daniel and the lion's den. He just, he just doesn't let up on his people. And the neat thing about all that is we become the recipients of miracles and, and uh, of, of, of tremendous faith adventures. God always uses his people for great things. Can I get an amen? amen? So Isaiah said in chapter 48, verse 9, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Now, out of the message, and we talked about that even this week, sometimes you read something to King James, it seems a little heavy, a little meaty. So let's see what it says in the message. It says, But out of the sheer goodness of my heart, because of who I am, I keep a tight rein on my anger, and I hold my temper. This is God talking. I don't wash my hands of you. Do you see what I've done? I've refined you, but not without fire. I've tested you like silver in the furnace of affliction. I pray that it's been the testimony of other people about you that you are not the same person you were before you got born again. And that as you've been saved and you've been walking with God for a while, that you've start, your anger, all the things that you were before, has started diminishing. People get around you and say, well, HD ain't nothing like he was back in Bradshaw High School in Florence, Alabama. You know, he, he's different. And that's the way our life should be. Father, take your word, change us with it. Use your, the fire and all the things we go through in life, the furnace, Lord, to make us more like you. We give you praise for that this morning. Lord, we thank you for change in Jesus' name. Everybody sit. Amen. amen. Give me a big amen. 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 You may be seated. Refine. He said, I refined you 
in the furnace of affliction. The word refine in the Webster means to free from unwanted impurities. They're free from moral imperfection. To improve by perfect, uh, by perfect, by pruning. We're not going to talk much about pruning this morning, mainly about purifi- purifying. But the word refine in the Hebrew language means to fuse, to melt by heat, to burn away impurities. Honestly, if you could break away from so many things that have held you back, would you do it? Would you believe God for it? Would you allow God opportunity to take away the, the impatience that you have by putting you in Houston traffic? Would you allow God to start working on the, you know, the, the loneliness that you feel by giving you direction in life and start moving you toward a certain place that, that you realize I don't have to have people around me in order to get rid of this. I'm not lonely no more. I'm just alone. Can you handle that? Can you start working through things in your life that the fear that used to grip you and hold you and paralyze you is now diminishing and letting go of you? All the insecurities that you once fought in life is starting to leave you. The comparison, every time you get around certain people, you start comparing yourself to other people and say, well, I'm not as, I'm not as pretty, I'm not as handsome, I'm not as tall, I'm not as short, I'm not this, I'm not that. And you start working through things like that in your mind. And as you do, you realize, God, will you take that from me? And then God starts putting you through the furnace. Everybody say, through the furnace. Amen. He starts pushing you through it. Why do he do that? To purify you. And how do he do it? It was through heat. To forge metal, it must go through the furnace to remove impurities. Psalm 37, 30, uh, 23 says, The steps of a good man, well, they're ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You know, when you're going through life, it, there are times that you, will, you feel like you fail. Can I tell you something about failure? Failure, my friend, is not a fact. It's an opinion. I said, failure is not a fact, it's an opinion. As a matter of fact, it was failure that showed me what success was going to be like. So when I've gone through failure in life, I just found a new way not to do something. So I start moving another way. He said that the righteous falls seven times, but each time he gets back up. A test requires failing or passing. If you are not failing or passing, you're uh, you're being tested. Somewhere in, in life, you're going to go through the test. I would so dread test. Oh, put your pencil on the desk. I don't remember how you done it, but I remember. Your hands off to the side, and your head forward, and then they would lay that thing face down, and then they'd say, go, and you flipped it up, and you looked at it. And if, he, if you had studied, there's a certain joy in life knowing that you know the test. I mean, you know, you look down at that thing, you ha, 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 I know this test. I used to love the test that was uh, either or. That means, yeah, multiple, I got 50, 50 chance here that I'm going to pass this thing if I hadn't studied it. But, man, when you studied, you blazed through it, you turn that thing in, you know that you've done well, you've passed the test. It is your decision to make the mistake a part of the process. I've got to look at the things. Uh, hey, uh, and if you've not made a mistake yet, you've not lived long enough. And when you make a mistake, you got to make a decision. Okay, was it the end of my world or was that a part of my process? And i got to take that mistake and say, I'm going to add that into my life, into the furnace of my life, and I'm going to press on through with it here. The fact you failed, my friend, is proof that you are not finished. You've got unfinished business. You may have failed in certain areas, but it's unfinished. I'm unfinished when it comes to being a parent. i got things I still want to see in the lives of my children. And in my children's children. I, so I have unfinished things in my own life. So i got to keep pressing there. So the fact that I may have failed in certain areas is proof that I've not finished here. Failures and mistakes can be a bridge. They don't have to be a barricade to success. Though I failed, okay, I've got to figure out another way here. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6 says, I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Let me mention something about aggravation. There are certain people you need to quit praying that God takes out of your life. Because God put them there (laughs) to test you in the furnace. And you can keep asking God to get rid of them, but I'm going to tell you something. There's somebody out there worse than them. I mean, I I quit praying a long time ago for certain folk to leave the church. Now, pastor... You don't do that. I just quit. I said, Lord, because every time I do and they go and it, it's, it's worse, it comes. I'm just going to settle with what you've got. I'm going to work on them, and I know they're working on me. Amen. Amen. They're always working on me. So you just keep on working with it. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it, pure, uh, proved pure. Genuine faith 
put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps his, uh, this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. The trial of your faith is the phrase he uses here. The testing uh, of your faith. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. You would think after a little while with Jesus, the disciples would get it. But the scripture says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. He said unto them, Let's go over unto the other side of the lake. As they launched forth, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus, please don't fall asleep if there's a storm coming. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. Understand this. A lot of storms on huge lakes come off the mountains. They come down. They, they pelt you. They're coming off the mountain. They're coming down to him. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. Here it came. And the scripture says, uh, there a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. When he, then he arose, he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? In other, and they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I, my mind just, I, see, I don't see a boat, I see a ship. I see something big enough to haul 14, 15, 16 guys. I see Jesus going down in the hull and laying down, putting his head on the pillar. I see him dreaming about heaven. I see the storm coming down and start beating that thing. And here's what I know. According to the book of Isaiah, they were in the furnace. I know it looked like they were in the boat. Your furnace might look like a, a boat. It might look like your home. It might look like your job. Amen. It doesn't always look like something fiery. It's just something where you're at at that time. And here Jesus is in the boat. He's sleeping. The disciples are, are fearful. And the issue of that whole moment, I, I believe this. When Jesus put his head down, he was, he was praying for his disciples. God, help them in this time of furnace because I know something is coming. Amen. And it was their faith that he wanted to. All through Scripture, it's your faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's something that I'm hoping for. i got to believe God for it. It rises up in you. Faith says there will be miracles. Faith says I will be prosperous. Faith says I will be blessed. Faith says I can do this thing. Faith says I will get through the storm. Water coming over in the boat. I mean, it's one thing when the boat's in the water. It's another thing when the water's in the boat. The boat starts to sink. They cry out, ah, help us. Jesus gets up, rebukes the wind. Says to them, peace, and then he chews them. I don't see him chewing them out, but it wasn't nice. You ever look at somebody going through it and said, here's one of my favorite statements. You need a bigger Jesus. You need a bigger Jesus. You need to get your big drawers on and get a bigger Jesus. I mean, you're handling life as if somehow you don't know. And another thing, I'll get around people I've been preaching to for years, and they should have been hearing me preach about the things that, and, the, and the things that I've gone through in life and other people gone through in life, and a little bit of something comes along, and they fall apart. And I'm saying, dear God. <laughs> it's almost like Jesus said to me, well, you prayed they'd leave. <laughs> well, they still here. Well, I don't mean to be mean. Not at all. But when Jesus said, where's your faith? That's what he's saying. You need to make me bigger in your life. You need to handle the furnace that you're going through. He said only two sentences. He told them what to do, and he asked them, where's your faith? The purpose of the storm was for them to locate their faith. When you're going through things in life, you say, well, I got faith. But when you go through things and you go through the furnace, that's when your faith is located. That's when you know that you got it. How do you say that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Hebrew boys that would not bow down to this giant uh, idol of Nebuchadnezzar. They weren't going to do it. Everybody else bowed down. They took them. They put them in the furnace. You know the story. When they put them inside the furnace, there had to be a screaming out from others. Don't, don't, don't do it. This is, it there's, it's not the worst than the smell of burnt flesh. And they take them. The scripture says as they were putting them in the furnace, the very men that put them in burned. And there inside the furnace, they looked inside, Nebuchadnezzar did, and there was a fourth man walking around in the fire. Amen. There was a t in other words, they found their faith. It wasn't just standing out there, but their faith was found in the fire. When Daniel was in the den, his faith was found in the den, and it shut the mouths of the lions. When you're going through things in life, there are times, I'll be honest, you can just hit life on cruise control. Just hit that button. I love cruise control. 
My motorcycle has cruise control. I'm going to put cruise control on my lawnmower. I love me some cruise control. I just hit that button. I just sit back, Sam, just, just take it easy. And there's times in life, many of us, we run on cruise control. We hit that button. Life goes on. It's eight hours. It's home. It's work. It's eight hours. It's home. It's work. We just go through cruise. And then all of a sudden, a storm comes up. Or something happens to one of our children or somebody that we love. And next thing, our faith is located in that furnace. And God begins to try us at that moment. The scripture tells us as iron sharpens iron, one man, one person sharpens another. You'll find out when you deal with iron that it ain't two knives that hit together. And one's an anvil and one's a knife. Amen. In other words, what God's fixing to hit you with is a lot harder than what you are right now. And because of that, he's going to make you better than what you ever were before. It's the contrast that sharpens. Amen. God uses people. He brings people into your life. Amen. To, as, as tools. I've chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Not out of the furnace. It was in the furnace. In other words, it was when you were in there that I said, uh-huh, I want that guy on my team. I want that girl. That girl right there knows how to handle a fire. She knows how to handle pressure. I want her right here on my team. The furnace literally means to dig through the ranges. In other words, while you had to dig your way through it, God was watching you. He's been observing you in the furnace. He knows he's fixing to pick you out of there. The affliction, my friend, misery that produces not just depression but decision. Sometimes you go through something, it'll force you to decide. In other words, you're just moving through life on cruise control, and then boom, something hits. Now you've got to make a decision. Some of us, we hate making decisions. What are you going to eat? The worst thing a man ever said to a woman, where you want to eat. I, I get so, I, I, I don't, I, I, a lot of times I just go somewhere. I just go somewhere. Because I know if I ask, And if you ask me, well, you want to eat McDonald's. Well, I don't want to eat at McDonald's. Or they'll do this right here. Whatever's good with you. <laughs> la, la, la. Well, we hate to make those decisions. But under the pressure, listen to me. You personally have to make your own decision. You've got to decide under the pressure at that moment what you're going to do. He said, I chose you. I tried you, and then I selected you. Job went through testing. When I do funerals, oftentimes I will, I will pull this scripture up because it just it hits me. Job's life was one of suffering. Of course, Satan had, had told God that he said, uh, Job will bow. God said, no, he won't. He said, you take your hand off of him. Let me hurt him, and I'll show you that he'll bow. And he got struck with disease. He got his children. Ten of his kids have died. He's lost all his economy. We find him sitting by a heap, scraping the sores on his body with broken pottery, ashes all around him. And the Scripture says Job made this statement. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. Backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand, but I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I will take. And when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When I've gone through. In other words, I found myself in this place of affliction. I found myself in this furnace. My body's aching. I'm hurting. My friends are idiots. My wife says that I should curse God and die. The only other thing she said nice to me was, my breath stinks. Thank you, Lord, for leaving her when you took my children. I'm in this place of furnace. I'm in this heat. I'm in this hard time of life right now. And I can tell you this. I can't find him. I can't find him. On the left hand where he doth work. God is not schizophrenic, but God is ambidextrous. He can use both hands. And only one place in the Bible does it mention his left hand. Every other place it's his right hand. The right hand of power. The right hand of blessing. The right hand of receiving. The, the, the right hand of fellowship. Right hand sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. But one scripture he brings out, Job says, God's got a left hand too. And he's working with the left hand, but he's hiding himself with the right hand. In other words, I can't see what he's doing, but he's doing He's doing something. Even when you can't feel it, 
Even when you don't perceive it. When you are in the furnace and you think God has forgot you, the flood has hit you, your homes are wrecked, everything's gone down, God said, listen, I got you. I'm upholding you with one hand and working with the other hand. I've never forgot. So Job went through his testings, and he realized at that moment in that furnace, God was changing him. You know God blessed Job before it was over with? Yeah. Amen. He come through with flying colors. Uh, it, it, even his wife stayed. Come on. Amen. I mean, they got through it. David had testing. Psalm 66, verse 10 says, He trained us first, passed us like silver through refining fires, brought us into hard scrabble country, pushed us to our very limit, road tested us inside and out, took us to hell and back. What did your God do for you? He took me to hell and back. I'm reading out of the message here, as you can tell. Amen. Brought us a, a road tested us inside out, took us to hell and back. Finally, he brought us to this well, well watered place. I'm bringing my prizes and pres presents to your house. I'm doing what I said I would do. Amen. He trained us, he passed us through uh, the refining fires. David, you look at David's life. A man who, who killed a giant, ends up running from Saul. Uh, he, he, Saul tries to pin him to the wall. It, he's, he's in a cave. With Saul, King Saul goes into the cave. The Bible says to relieve himself. He's hunting David to kill him. David's in the back of the cave, and he comes out of the cave. <laughs> Walks up behind Saul while he's relieving himself and cuts off a hem of his garment and backs away. And when Saul turns around, he shows it to him and said, I could have killed you, sir, but I'm not going to touch the anointing of God. I'm not going to do it. All through David's life, we see refine, refining, refining, furnace and furnace. Every now and then, he put his life on. You know, sometimes cruise control can get you in trouble. And that's what happened with David's life. He just sat on cruise control, got him in a little trouble. But then he bounces back. He was refined. Let me start closing here. Process, you cannot, uh, you can't just take a piece of metal and cut it down on one side, down on the other side and say, okay, that's a, that's a knife. Now, it doesn't work that way. When, when, you make, when you make a blade, it has to go through the process. And this here is what, what they call Damascus steel. It's been folded over and folded over and beat down and beat down and heated up and beat down. It's, it's a reason why it's a small knife is Damascus is so expensive. Yeah, yeah. Amen. So it's better <laughs> you should have a little. But, but the issue, very sharp and very hard. It's amazing the process that we go through in life. That God keeps folding you back over yourself. Working through you again. Here's my thing. Quit running from him. Ask God in wherever you're at right now, Lord, what is it you want to do in my life? What is it you want to do in my life? I'm going to tell you, the process is worth it. When you come out of the process, you're able to cut things. Amen. You're just not a, a, a blunt something. You're able to cut that devil up. You're able to speak the word of God. You're able to say, I went through it. I went through it. Somebody said, Pastor, I just found out uh, I got a disease in my body. I had that disease. I went through it. One of my great joys is looking at people that have muscular dystrophy and telling them, you can make it. But you got to endure, and you got to be defiant. You got to decide to get up. You got to press through uh, the weakness. You got to keep moving through life. You can't just back away. And when, I have a friend that has cerebral palsy. His name is Josiah Haben. He lives in San Antonio. Josiah is in a miraculous place, a piano dick. He's, he's a wonderful young man. I've known his dad, Paul, for years. Some of you way back in the day might remember when Paul came and even led worship for us way back with Pastor Rick years ago. Uh, and I look at this young man's life. He takes karate, cerebral palsy. His best move is to grab hold of you and fall down. But if he can get you on the ground, he got you. Whatever affliction you've been in, whatever you've gone through, you're going to attract others with it. I've often found that affliction introduces us to our purpose. It introduces. It says, hello, this is what you're here to do. I have a heart for adoption. You know that. It was an affliction. What I, I carry my body, it's an affliction. And I keep fighting. I'll constantly fight it tell you some things about process process my friend the definition i will use today is a systematic series of events or activities that produce a desired goal an objective or an end but notice the word events everybody has events in their life some things we schedule events sometimes 
they're uneventful. Sometimes they just happen. We, need, we didn't schedule them. They just happen. It's like the, the storm blowing up on the waters. Process determines the value of the product. Process determines the value of the product. When you're beginning process, it is what I've made it through that determines my value. When I meet people that have gone through something, they're valuable to me. I have a few pastor friends that have gone through things in life. And, I, I, of course, I can relate to pastors, so I connect with them. They've gone through it. They're valuable. Valuable. The, the ladies that Sister Diane's going to teach in the retreat, they're valuable. They've gone through things. Amen. And just like Bethany shared in her testimony, the difference it made in her life. Process defines who you are. Number three, process discovers the location of your faith. You know, I found it in the furnace. I found that I was in the process on the lake. I found that I was in the process in the emergency room. Job found that he was in the process as he began to lose things in his life. But it was still a process. And if you, if you, if you hate the process, if you abort the process, you're going to start all over. God ain't going to. And he's always going to use people. He's always going to use people as tools to help you in a process. Amen. I'm always looking for friends. I'm always looking for folk that have gone through it. Encouragers. Somebody's going to help you stay the course. Life is a part of that. Process is part of the progress. There's joy in the journey. You think about when the destination is? My friend, the destination when they shut the lid on me. Until then, it's all about the journey. It's all about the, it's about enjoying the journey. You know, I look forward to the car show coming up at Easter and all the things that are moving through our year. I enjoyed yesterday, but it's all about the journey. It's pressing through it. Last couple points if you stand with me process is the passage the product must take to enjoy its purpose in other words uh, I, I had the joy of working for RC Cola I can tell you the process of a good RC I'm talking about it, it, if it's just lit it's got to be put in a bottle so you got to take the bottle and you got to run it through the cleaner because you don't know who all been drinking out of that bottle you remember the day when they had returnable bottles? You, some of you don't even got no idea. I actually am the guy that stood up one day and said, plastic ain't never going to make it. Texting will never go through. That texting's from the devil. I ain't, I, I, we're not going to be texting. Now I text. You can't hardly find a returnable bottle unless you dig it up out of the dirt. We'd take him returnable bottles. We'd bring them in. They'd run it through the washer. They'd wash it sterilize it then it would go down through a channel and it'd be filled with that wonderful delicious rc cola and it would be capped 40 about 42 degrees when they capped it so it'd have that nice uh, condensation on the outside of it it would go all the way through the process to come around in our lives in order for god to make a david a job a rahab a Joshua, a Moses, a Sarah, they got to go through the process. You got to go through it. Process, again, is the passage the product must take to enjoy its purpose. Last point, your prosperity is in your purpose. So do not abort the process. We went through the fire, I, Psalm 66, we went through the fire and the water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. My blessing is connected to my process. I got to stay with it. Where I'm at today has been a process. Where you at today has been a process. And you understand it connected you. Forged. I don't mind the beating as long as I know it's God who's holding the hammer. As long as, because I know he knows how to do it. He knows when to do it. He knows when to strike when I'm uh, flexible. When they heat that metal up and it gets flexible and it gets hit, it moves a little. He doesn't strike me when I'm cold. That just hurt. That'd give a headache. He hits me when I'm, I'm flexible. Let's pray. Father, there are people in this house that have seen themselves in the furnace today. Lord, remind them this is the process. Your intentions are not to hurt us abuse us or neglect us. But God, you want to make us in the image of your son. 
And when I see what Jesus went through on this earth, in just three years, that quick process that brought him into the sonship to make him our Redeemer and Savior. I'm grateful. I'm just grateful. I'm appreciative. I'm thankful. God, whatever you throw at us over the next coming years, may we be able to be pliable, to be able to be used. God, that you prepare us for what you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Say this with me. Say this with me. He's preparing me for what he has prepared for me. If you hang on to that and keep believing it, you'll realize that everything you're going through right now, he's preparing you for something he has for you. You say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm 60, 70, 80 years old. Do you think God has a limit? Has a, has a place where he says, all right, yeah, you're just too old to be used. Best evangelists I know are elderly people. You know why? Because they don't care what they say. Amen. Your opinion don't bother them no more. God bless you. Be seated. Our servant leaders are coming up. I pray you've been enjoying the rodeo this year. Amen. I hadn't had a chance to make it down. But please, you get opportunity. You know you're going to enjoy that. appreciate your faithfulness. This house does. We talked about this yesterday in our stable in the saddle. The purpose of tithing, our, our obligation to the king. Amen. If you need to tithe the offer and envelope, lift your hand. Our servant leaders will make their way to you as David comes up here. Amen. We have a uh, swap seniors meet today, right after service. See. <laughs> okay, so if I got that right, we we got in the back <laughs> fellowship hall, and then y'all gonna meet, do a short Bible study, and then a movie, and then Joe's Italian Grill. Perfect. Come on. They having fun today. Wish I was a little older. Uh, March 16th. Now, I don't understand. Uh, I don't see Miss Diane. Miss Diane, why does it say March 16th? Okay, okay. That's why I was so confused because I was like, March 16th, April 6th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. I was like, okay. So, March 15th, 16th, there will be a meeting here at the church. And that's the monthly meeting. Third Sunday every month. Third third Saturday. I'm sorry. That's what that's what I said. Third third Saturday every month. And then on April 5th, 6th, and 7th at Camp Holy Wild, there will be the advance. And if you guys have any questions, stand right there. March 17th, Lift Ladies Bible Study. See Miss Diane. Um, anything special y'all doing this week? Come on. That's <laughs> there you go. Holy Spirit. He said she said they're studying boundaries. So the the video earlier. March twenty seventh, uh twenty second uh is the ropes course. It's Friday, March twenty second, nine AM. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, why does it say Friday? It's normally Saturday. So uh, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know that, but what I'm saying is normally we do everything on Saturday morning, so I'm not sure on that one. I'll get back to you on Tuesday. Uh, March 31st, clothing ministry in Taden's Pantry, open on the 5th Sunday of March. So on the 5th Sunday this month, there will be uh, open in the back. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to moss, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. 